Hi, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to Live from NYPL. I'm Faye Rosenfeld, and I am the Vice President of Public Programs at the New York Public Library. Tonight, we are all in for a treat. We have two beloved and distinguished writers, Nicole Kraus and Judith Thurman, with us to discuss Nicole's newest book and her first collection of short fiction, To Be a Man. If you have not yet purchased a copy of To Be a Man, you can do that online at the NYPL shop. Just go to nypl.org shop. Proceeds from purchases made there benefit the New York Public Library. Nicole is, of course, an award-winning and best-selling author whose previous work includes four highly acclaimed novels, Man Walks Into a Room, The History of Love, Great House, and Forest Dark. Her work has been translated into 37 languages, and she's been hailed by the New York Times as one of America's most important novelists. She's also a former fellow of the library's Culman Center for Scholars and Writers, and we are thrilled to welcome her back to the New York Public Library, albeit virtually. And we're delighted that Judith Thurman is here to speak with Nicole about her book. Judith is a biographer, literary critic, essayist, and longtime staff writer for The New Yorker. Her books include biographies of two of the 20th century's most extraordinary women of letters, the French novelist Colette and the Danish author Karen Blixen, better known as Isaac Dennison. Judith's biography of Isaac Dennison won the National Book Award and was the basis for the Academy Award winning, winning film, Out of Africa. I'll bring Nicole and Judith on screen in a moment, but first I wanna let you know about some upcoming literary conversations and other exciting programs that I hope you can all find time to attend and enjoy. Tomorrow night, as you may have heard in our uh, pre-event slideshow, Isaac Fitzgerald will be joined by Min Jin Lee, Marlon James, Susan Choi, and Robert Jones Jr. to discuss writing in and about the city we all love and call home, the city of New York. Next week on Monday, Showtime's Jesus and Miro will share life lessons from the Bronx in conversation with New York Times Magazine's Lovia Giarchi. On Tuesday, the eminent historian and biographer David Nassau will speak with Atina Grossman about his newest book, The Last Million. On Wednesday, Aminatu So and Ann Friedman, hosts of the podcast Call Your Girlfriend, will speak with Rebecca Traster about their new book, Big Friendship. And last but not least, we will end our season on Thursday, December 17th with a panel of beloved New York City comedians who will hopefully help us find a way to laugh through some of the pain that was 2020. You can find information about all these events and more at nypl.org slash live. Just two quick program notes. Nicole and Judith will speak for around 45 minutes and then take questions. You can ask a question at any time by typing it into the Q&A box on Zoom or into the YouTube chat if you're watching there, or you can send an email to publicprograms at nypl.org and we will make sure that they see it. Also captioning is being provided tonight via stream text. You can find a link in the confirmation email that you received when you signed up and in the YouTube uh, or Zoom chat. I wanna thank you all for being here with us tonight and for being part of the New York Public Library community. And now please welcome Nicole Krauss and Judith Thurman. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? I can, and I can see you. Both. I can see you too. I'm so happy to see you. I'm sorry we're not sitting next to each other on the stage, um, but um, it's a treat. I just want to tell the audience that uh, this is one of the best works of fiction I've read in a very long time. I read it for the second time the last few days, and uh, it's just as it's just a um, the subtleties you have to. It, it's so subtle. There's there's so much subtlety to the writing, to the to the characters, and to the structure that it, it's a book to last. Um, you, Nicole, you and I were talking, just emailing back and forth about the subject of identity and individuation. And there's a in the a, it's something that I wrote for the New Yorker. There's a Danish biographer who said biography tracks the process of individuation to the point at which it fails. And we talked about that a little bit. And as I reread this, I realized that in some ways, this is a collection of stories about the way we become who we are or fail to become who we are or stall in the process. So I wanted to start by asking you how this volume of stories became what it is. Yeah, I, I um, well, you gave that beautiful talk about how you became a biographer and and I swatched you and then I begged you for the text and then I reread it and that line just sort of like leaped out and grabbed me about 
the Danish biographer, we don't know who, I don't know who it was who said that, but it's such a beautiful line about tracking the process of individuation until it breaks down. And I actually asked you, I think I know what it means, but what does that mean? Because I think on two levels, that's kind of what I'm busy doing, both, of course, in my life as a writer, but also what I'm interested in with my characters. I'm interested in that process. And you describe it elsewhere so beautifully in that talk as um, this, you pose this question, how does one become oneself, an individual and a woman? And that question can also be asked and a man. And those, these stories ask that and, you know, sometimes the question of gender is involved and sometimes not. I think early on, I just had this idea that I was gonna, that I loved writing short stories and that it was just a really late discovery for me because unlike a lot of fiction writers who start and go through the various, you know, gears, they very often go to MFA programs and start with short fiction. I started, I think like you as a poet and mm -hmm. then at 25 just had this revelation that I was completely entrapped in the poetry and that I needed to refine the freedom with which writing began for me at 14. And it was just like, almost like this claustrophobia, like I need to like break a window that I couldn't breathe enough. And, and I just thought, okay, I'll try this fiction thing and I'll actually try this novel thing because it seems like people can live like that and living like a poet is kind of tough from what, I, from what I've Absolutely. witnessed. And so I literally, without any education beyond obsessive reading of novels, just sat down and wrote one. And I just like immediately fell in love with the form and I just felt that it fit me. And it fit me because it's imperfect. Like a novel, it's just always ill-defined, can't be defined, necessarily imperfect, but it like just felt comfortable. I felt at home in it. And so years passed and I wrote a bunch of them and I was just there and so I never did that thing that grows a fiction writer, which is the short story. And I came to it late. And by the time I came to it, it was just like a playful, it was so playful. Like you don't have to spend years on it. <laughs> you don't have to pull out all your hair. You don't have to go gray over it or cry over the structure, finding completeness in a whole. And you can just start it. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And I just found like a, yet again, like another discovery of joy. And that joy has to do with new freedom, right? So each form allowing for something you, I couldn't do before. And then I just thought I'd like to do more of this. And so I had a few and I planned this collection and I had this title before I wrote most of the stories. <laughs> I was gonna ask about that. I have a, you, you've answered in different ways. I wanna come back to a lot of questions that I had. Um, one of them being, you use the word expansion. It's sort of like a, a leitmotif in the book, the, the, the notion of expanding your boundaries bursting them in some cases, violently in some cases, violating them in some cases. And, but this also this, this sort of expansion. And um, did this, did, did, did working this way in a new genre or not, well, a similar genre, but in a different scale with a different sense of freedom, did, how, did it, how did it affect you? How do you think it changed you? What kind of expansion was there? Yeah, yeah. I think you're right to have picked out that word. And I think it goes with the claustrophobia, like the freedom and the claustrophobia, right? There's always this like wrestling for more space to be, right? Just like one life is not enough, too much language, need more possibility in life, have to become other people, <laughs> need to expand. And so I think it was exciting to you about the story. It's just like more becoming, like more, more people to be, more, um, possibilities of, and also of characters and conditions that I might not have been able to have had the like resources to inhabit for years, the way that I have. For to. example, for example, in this. Oh, thing. for example, and there's that story in the garden, which is about, it's told by the narrator is this assistant to the most famous landscape architect in Latin America. It's sort of an unnamed country and, and this assistant is a kind of devotee of this artist of the landscape and, and stumbles with him into real evil in a sense. I mean, becomes a collaborator or an accomplice. At one point he asks this question, what is it to acquiesce to the acquiescent? Because yeah. this landscape architect 
basically is given this project, this wonderful project to make this big new public park and it's under a military regime and they kind of stop construction and insist on this lake in the center of the park, which becomes a grave, right? And, and for, for those who are killed. And, and so that's not a, a novel I wanted to live with. And yet that idea came out of something really playful. It came out of um, a visit to Brazil and, vis and visiting Roberto Beryl Marx's house and garden, this incredible landscape architect in Rio de Janeiro who sort of brought modernist architecture and the notion of the importance of native species rather than English gardens <laughs> in Brazil. And I just fell in love with him and his work and it was just a playful idea. And then it got kind of dark. I mean, it got a, became a, quite a dark story and I wouldn't have wanted to live there. I'd, it's not, there wasn't enough ideas there even, forget the darkness that I would have wanted to inhabit that person and that story for years. But it, there was a lot there that I wanted to be in for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, I can give you other examples, but but I, I think of it like that. And it's not very planned out, Judith. Like, you know, a lot of times I start things and I think, is this a novel? Like, is this my mother? <laughs> is, this my, you know, is this a novel? Is this a story? Is this, and it doesn't really matter much, the form, just what's alive. If it feels alive, it's kind of like how many, you know, what is this, how many words does this require to keep it most alive? Well, I think that the writers who ultimately mean the most of us are the ones who make us feel most alive mm. uh, in their own struggle to be alive and their own struggle to make the language alive. And, and I think this book is, is about that. I mean, in so many different ways, and maybe each story in a different way is really about that. I was thinking uh, there's a lot of failure too in uh, of grappling with it and failure. I was thinking uh, in, um, uh, in Zusia, which I, I absolutely love, Zuzia on the roof, uh, Brodman, who is a cranky old Jewish guy who has got, gone through a lot. And he, among his thoughts of the, the um, quote, he had, he had failed to become fully himself, had instead given in to ancient pressures. And those are the ancient pressures of being a Jew. And I, my next question is really, our beloved mutual friend lamented and, and this terribly Philip Roth always hated being described as a Jewish writer or a Jewish American writer. Um, and he was both very Jewishly a moralist and an amoralist. And I think you are too. Uh, but I wonder on the score of being a Jewish writer, it's, this is a book, of course, um, it, it, some of it is set in Israel. Some of your work has been, been set in Israel. You have this sort of dual sense of consciousness. One of the characters talks about not having a sense of place because she's rooted in two different places. So how does that, your landscape, how does that situate it? Yeah, I always think about how like Philip's legacy to those of us who um, were listening was about this valuing of wrestling, like how far you could take wrestling. But to wrestle, you have to have something that's engaging you. <laughs> And that thing that engages you and engages all of us can be many, many things. It can be uh, the requirements of what are expected of you as a woman, but it can also be 3,000 years of Jewish history and you're Jewish, you know, whatever, for Philip, it was, you know, many, many things. But I think one needs something the, the, to throw off. I do. I mean, in my, in my gasp and grasping for my freedom, and my process of individuation, as we described, that's, I guess, the work of every writer, every artist, I guess, in the end. Um, but I, I wouldn't, you know, I think I feel the same bristling at just being defined in any way. I don't, it doesn't matter, Jewish, I just don't wanna be defined. And, and in the end, my, the way that I come to terms with that is to think, really, I was like, damn lucky to be born into such great material, like really, really lucky. <laughs> so why am I complaining? Like, really, like, what a gift, like all of that psychology and history and memory and complication and doubting and wrestling and textual and intellectual. It's wonderful. And it's mine to wrestle with. And so if that comes along with being called a Jewish writer, I guess I can live with that. But I kind of prefer just not to have to consider myself, like not to have to call myself anything and like leave that to others at the end of the day. And I won't object. There's a, another wonderful line from Zusia. Uh, he's brought in sums up the experience of the Jews as 3000 years of treacherous remembering, 
highly regarded suffering and waiting. And the genius is the highly regarded suffering because that sums up so much for so many millions of people, young people, artists, rebels, transgressors, that, that highly regarded suffering. Um, <laughs> there's a mystical bent though to your work. And I wonder if that, that seems to in some way be related to uh, a certain kind of Jewish mysticism to a certain kind of the, 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 the playful Gogolian mysticism of certain Jewish folk tales. And, and I, I don't know if that's just something I'm reading into it or if it's actually there. It's, it's in the husband, certainly it's in. Yeah, I mean, I mean I, I'm fundamentally interested in the mystery of things and I'm not at all interested in resolving the mystery. And I think that mystery can go in a mystical direction at times, like you know, in the last book in Forest Dark, there was a lot about Jewish, literally about Jewish mysticism and symptom and God withdrawing from the you know infinite space to create a finite space. All of that is fascinating to me, but there's also just like the everyday mystery of being, and it's like as simple, you know, it's as simple as the mystery of the people we go to bed next to and wake up in the morning with, and the fact that we never solve that mystery. It's also the mystery of, you know, the things that we're supposed to, even the things we're supposed to most easily understand, like what is this glass here? We don't understand. I can, like I have linguistic versions of what that might be, but it's fundamentally like a phenomenon in consciousness and we don't know why it happens. And like everything is a mystery. And I, I like to live with, I don't have a problem living with that. I'm interested in that and how we negotiate on large and small levels our lives with incomplete knowing. And sometimes not just incomplete knowing with like a kind of fascination with and wonder and inclusion of the unknowable. So my stories, I just try, I'm interested in leaving space for that rather than narrowing the possibility. Well, it's, 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 it's one of your great gifts is, is uh, as a storyteller is you have a particular sense of wryness and the sense of irony, and there's no bitterness in it as there often is in irony, and there's no didacticism in it. It's, um, it's dispassionate, and it's comic in places, and it's tragic in, in places, but it's, and, and I was thinking of what, how, how, to, how to convey this, and, um, and you've just said it though, it's a way of containing, of expressing human contradictions without trying to resolve them. You know, it's like, you, they're there, they're, 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 they're that they exist at the same time, they're simultaneous, they're, uh, um, but are, are you- I wanna pause on that for a second, Judith, because like years ago, before I had the luck of actually getting to know you, I read a profile that you wrote of Yasmina Reza in The New Yorker. And I had really been fascinated by her. I had been reading her novels I had seen her, some of her plays and I got really interested in her novels. And then that profile came along and I was just totally riveted by your portrait of her. And there was this line in there, was that 2011 or something? I can't remember when it was. I think it was, it was even earlier. But yeah. Yeah. So there was this line in there, I'm probably gonna muck it up right now. So you might correct me, but there's a line where she's, she's talking about a person in her life. She's talking about her father. And she said, she's talking about how he was brutal but loving, but his brutality wasn't malicious. And she, she says that she understood from him that people can't be reduced. And that without that lesson, she could have never become a writer. And it, I remember when I read that, it just was like, it just like was, it straightened something up in me that I felt but hadn't articulated and has since been a kind of guiding thought for me in terms of the kind of characters that I notice that I'm interested in. And the fact that, I, you know, I don't want, people aren't reducible. I don't want to write about people who are reducible. And, and literature allows us this possibility of, of, of the parrot of looking at people and all of their contradictions and just looking at them, just holding them alight and looking at how do they deal with that? How, how every day, do they deal with that? And where does it take them? And the what kind of struggles does that require? Um, it's, it's wonderful to hear that. I mean, I, I think she's also a remarkable novelist and she's better known for her place, but she's an incredible novelist. And, uh, and bringing it back to the notion of the father who's such an important figure to her. 
And this is also a book about fathers. There, there are, it's a book about men of all kinds, sons, lovers, brothers. Uh, and, and, um, and there's one trans person in the story, which is a wonderful moment um, when Jessica comes back the next year and is Kevin. Yeah. Um, but the, the role of the father seems to be a very basic one in your, in your fiction and certainly in this book. And to be a man uh, is, pays, uh, begins you know, with, with, a, with a mini portrait of a, of, of a father. And there's a fantastic, well, you, you're gonna read this a little bit at the end, but before, um, before that, uh, it's one of, the, one of the lines that shows the poet has never uh, gone away. Wait, it's a fun page, sorry. Um, here, it's a beautiful metaphor, and it's and it's sort of speaks to everything you've been saying about letting people be with all of their contradictions. Uh, the narrator's father, one day. If his life seems long to me, it's because he has changed more than anyone I know. One day over the course of many years, there's no other way to put it. He took all his great anger out to sea, let the wind out of its sails and came back home without it. And that's, it's, it's an incredible description of the transformation my throat catches when I read it, when I read it again. Um, but, there's more, there's, there's sort of more about fathers in, in, in this collection than about mothers, certainly. Yeah, I think that, you know, I've thought a lot about the title, To Be a Man, when this is a collection that has seven of the 10 stories told by women. And I thought that part of what drew me to that title is not just the fact that it's a title story, which really is about looking at men and boys and what it is to be a man, but that there isn't a woman who becomes herself <laughs> and becomes a woman without wondering what it would have been like to be a man. Absolutely, right. <laughs> what would it have been like to be a man and, and what liberties would that have given one, including being furious and enraged and angry <laughs> and, and not having that be stymied um, or, or repressed, I guess. Or shamed also. Or shamed. Or shamed. And I think, you know, so there's, there's always two things happening in my mind in this book when I'm thinking about being men, I'm also thinking about how women think about that. And, 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 you know, when the father gives up his anger, goes out to sea and lets it go, but he's also had the lifetime of curse and luxury of that anger. And, and there's the question of, you know, what do, what do young women do with their, anger and in this book you know there's for example in the story end days there's Noah who's 16 whose parents decide on this amicable divorce and she's sort of the last to know and never knew what, where that was coming and it's it's just at a moment where she's entering into her adult sense of herself and love and what she wants and she's kind of left alone in her process of individuation <laughs> And there should be a lot of anger there. Her father goes off as he's an archaeologist in Israel, he goes to Megiddo to finish, you know, he's 20, 20 years of, of excavating there. And her mother goes back to Vienna to take care of her mother and her sister's off. And she's left alone to kind of deal with the wreckage of this empty house. And, and where is her fury, you know? And what she decides to do with that, I, I, I didn't know for a long time. In the end, she turns it into an act of, desire that she allows herself that goes against expectation and is completely and utterly her own you know while fires are burning in los angeles and the old order is ending in some deep <laughs> mystical way yes and she does something unthinkable she seduces a, a very pure um yeshiva orthodox jew who knows how pure he is judy yeah that's true that's so Bangkok, he's a student <laughs> now, and who knows what he was doing in Bangkok. But yes, and I mean, he's ready for her, right? <laughs> she takes what she wants, and he. And there are other, there are other. My favorite characters, in some ways, are 
there are these free spirits, these free female spirits in the book. And in a way, it made me think of Elena Ferrante and, and, um, uh, and the two friends. And one is, is she will not be dominated. She will not have her desire dictated to her. And the other one is the conformist. And the, and the um, she learns to please. And that's how she sort of makes her way. But in, 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 in uh, To Be a Man, there's Soroya in the opening story in Switzerland, who's the narrator's school friend. Um, and then many years later, the narrator has a daughter who reminds her of his qualities, that reminds her of Soroya. And there's Romy, the actress and the narrator's friend in Seeing Ashadi. And Romy, you write, Romy didn't live to convince others of anything. And that's like a sort of bomb. Um, and of the of Soroya, the narrator feels afraid of something in her and awed it, awed by it at the same time. Quote, afraid of what she lacked or what she possessed that drove her beyond the place where others would draw the limit. And, and then she thinks of her daughter, this beautiful 12-year-old. She has a proudness about her that refuses to grow small. It's her curiosity in her own power its reach and its limit that frightens me. Though maybe the truth is that when I am not afraid for her, I envy her. And I just, I, I think maybe every woman I know has had that friend, the friend who goes too far, the friend who is um, fearless. I don't know that fearless is the right word. Did you have, did you, are you that friend? Did you have that friend? Well, I have so many th thoughts about that. First of all, Romy, I mean, some, you know, some of these characters are wholly invented and some of them are mergings of various people and some of them are, you know, but Romy, I have a friend who's an absolutely brilliant Israeli actress, Yael Abakisis, and I could, I could actually see her drawing on her cigarette and the way that she touches the waiter and the way that she just, she's just always of and in the world and an absolute control over it. But it, everything that happens, every flick of the hair and every, is a testing of who she is and how she's received, how the world receives her. And it's a beautiful thing to watch. I never, never had that kind of, what is that? I don't know, I never had that. I'm too internal. <laughs> I, I don't know, I don't have it at all. And, I, and I've often, in, as a reader and as a biographer, I've observed it most often in uh, girls who had a particularly close relationship with a father who was neither abusive nor too seductive, but valued them, who gave them a mirror for their, their loveliness at the same time and a mirror for their intelligence too, so that they didn't have to choose. Mm. And that didn't- That's interesting, because I think in, in the case I'm thinking of, there was a father who was you know, always off having affairs and everything. There's something also about capturing attention. How, what can you do? that will forever keep you a kind of like bolt of electricity of other people's gaze. And what, I, mean, I don't know, I guess it, all kinds of things can contribute to it. But I think what interested me a lot, a lot in both of those stories, and I like that you put them together because I, I do think in, in this book, there are a lot of mirror stories where there are- Lots of, yes. Echo, wow. Right? And so those, there's echoes there. And they have to do with the moment that a young girl understands that she, it, one young girl looking at another young girl, for example, sees that that one has the ability or is involved in some process of self-definition that is resisting the, the norm, which is being defined, being defined by everything else around you. That that young woman who has that thing. That thing. <laughs> that thing is making the rules of the game and is reckless in a way because to not, you know, I mean, Soraya in Switzerland is reckless and the narrator only knows just how dangerous what she was getting involved with. She's, you know, gone off with an older man who's playing a, a pretty rough sexual game with her. But as the narrator saw, saw it as a 13 year old, Soraya had this ex exquisite inner authority that allowed her this, this belief that she could kind of, define herself or find out the limits of her own power um, or how far her own power could go in this arena of this older businessman, but he was almost irrelevant. He was almost irrelevant what she, what, who he was and what he wanted. And yes, he's a, he's a cipher. Himself. Yeah, he's a... 
and that interests me because that's familiar to me too. And I, I there were, you know, a bit from my own life and from friends, not, you know, there's this bits of that in, in all of us, that resistance that one has where you, there's an expectation that you will be victimized or by your experiences of eroticism or romance or just whatever, you know, happens to you as you But actually you use it a lot, don't you? You're also just, you're performing yourself there. Yes. In a, in a liberating way too. You, you write wonderfully about sex and in a very free way, it seems. Um, and uh, it, 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 in, it's not sensational and yet it, it's not sensational at all. It's very matter of fact, and, and, but it somehow, uh, it, it jumps off the page and sort of strikes you. And then you, you, there's no discontinuity in tone between you know, describing this and then describing some to people. I don't know if you can say this on the New York Public Library uh, uh, um, web, webcam, web thing, um, you know, to people fucking. So uh, you write with a lot of boldness. Did that come naturally? Do you, do you, uh, um, you have to think about that? Is that? Not, not too much. I, I think it's funny. I was asked this by a, I have a wonderful Italian journalist friend who I've been talking to for, I don't know, 15 years about books. And he's a sort of Polish, Jewish, Italian, you know, Israeli, one of those. And he asked me the same question. He couldn't quite bring himself to say the words. He said, you know, why do you use these vulgar words? And I said, because that's- That's what people say. That's what people say. And also because we are like, it's a, it's a theater, you know, like pornography is a theater. And sometimes when we enter into that, we enter into that theater and there's a language for that theater, you know? It's wonderful to read it so matter, matter of factly and accurately because there's no, uh, it's, um, it, it's the character thinking, she's thinking and we're, uh, we're voyeurs in a way at that moment of, of her thought not of her body so much as her thought and that's what's shocking that that yeah. that, that the um there's a, uh, not shocking it's not sexually shocking but it's, it's a sort of um uh very sort of interesting uh poignant in the french sense sort of stabbing yeah. uh, moments i th- i i just I, i've been asked about that before not just with this book in the last book and i'm i I don't, I think I'm not even aware of it as it's happening to be honest. And in part, I think, um, I don't know, it, just, it seems to me that it's a kind of, if I can't go there, then I'm not being true to the, to the woman. Because like, you know, one of the things about the question of to be a man, and this comes up with German boxer in the title story, is we don't often talk about what women talk about when they're together or alone with themselves about what they want from men. And it's not always the same as what is wanted um, in the domestic sphere or in the workplace. Absolutely, that's, it's so honest about it. You've, <laughs> written, about this, you've written about this more honestly than, uh, than any fiction that I can think of. I thought, wow, it's at odds. Yes, right. it's at odds. And I think, it, I think it's important to think about, I have two, you know, I'm raising two boys and and those contradictions are going to be their contradictions. They're not going to be resolved. And it's all a lot more complicated now when you're 14 and in health class, you're also learning about consent and how terribly wrong you can be in so many of your instincts, et cetera. And this question of what is asked of us, all of us, but let's say men, you know, in, this, in, in, in those other spheres is this kind of, you know, psychological fluency and sensitivity and all. But what we want in, in that is what women often want is but it's different. And so I want I want to I want both I want to talk about both of those things. I I, I it, you know it wouldn't wouldn't feel right to me not to, especially girls together when girls are talking amongst themselves. So sort of Romy and and, and you know and seeing her shoddy the narrator and Romy talking about boys and talking about you know their their sex lives. Um, I want to give us time both to have you do the reading and, and the questions. We're not, we have time. So that's, that's not, um, but because there's something that I also want to read from here because um, this is in a way an anatomy of love. I don't know if that's what you thought about it, that, if it, you know, it's my projection, but it is an anatomy of different ways that people love and the desire and love sometimes in the same place, often not in the same place, often not in the same way. Um, and the, the places that they that they um, diverge. And there's a fantastic 
description of love uh, in um, in Asha, in seeing Ashadi. She, they, the two friends have watched the, the great Iranian film and which is mostly a close up of this one actor who's not a professional or wasn't before he made the film. And his face is, I've seen it, it's, it's the most extraordinary expression. And then each of them has either a, a real or an imagined experience of seeing him running into him again that, 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 that is, is a, a moment of great meaning for them. And you write, what I knew of love had always stemmed from desire, from the wish to be altered or thrown off course by an uncontrollable force. But in my love for Ershadi, I nearly didn't exist beyond that great feeling. To call it compassion makes it sound like a form of divine love, but it wasn't that, it was terribly human. And uh, I, I just love, I, I loved navigating the book and coming across uh, these different attempts to understand the nature of. Yeah, of, yeah. Of, I, um, I'm going, I'm thinking again of what we were talking about in our emails. I guess that was yesterday morning, Judith, and this line about the process of individuation and where it breaks down. And you, you were talking about how that can happen at different times in people's lives. And sometimes it breaks down and starts up again, this, this process of becoming most clearly and expressively and wholly oneself. And you said at the end of that email that sometimes love is a powerful force in that, in, in, in helpful and unhelpful ways. I don't remember exactly how you put it, but I thought a lot about that afterwards. And I thought about it in, in the context of this collection because love is both of those things, right? It's like, you know, there's this possibility for the freedom it gives one to become something else in somebody else, a, a new witness, right? All of the being one can become with a fresh set of eyes on you and infinite possibility or what you take from that person like a, like a vampire, right? Because we're all vampiric in some sense, particularly when we're young and, and falling in love because we're shaping ourselves and we're borrowing from the, you know, the friends we love and the men we love and the, the older women and all of it. And, and so there's that, there's this huge opening that happens, but then other characters in this book are on that threshold where they've felt the closing down of that, the narrowing of what happens when a relationship has lasted a long time and it's no longer wide enough for new being, for to go back to that word expansiveness. And so the question is, do I stay or do I go? And that, that whole question of, where are we right now on that spectrum of needing to stay and needing stability and needing safety and relationship and, we're, and, and needing to be independent and needing to have new experience and freedom to evolve without somebody looking at us who already knows us is I think a it's a question in, in, in future emergencies for the narrator, you know, it's a question for the gardener, for the assistant gardener in that relationship it's a question for Tamar and the husband that story and and in so many of them I think there's because because of exactly that that love is can be both things to us confining and um expansive there's there's a great it's not a directly about love but um it is also directly about love um uh I can never in Amour. Um, wait, is it Amour, Victor, and? That's Future Emergencies. Future Emergencies, it's in Future Emergencies, sorry. Um, she's a, a docent at the Met and she's taking a group of, of people around and she's there in the photography section. And um, uh, there's a guy from Texas, the Yopi guy from Texas. And she, uh, but then she's home with her, her partner. Um, and she realizes suddenly, well, I won't, give, well I, can't, I won't say that, it was a spoiler alert, I withdraw that. She said, I wanted to tell him that there's a, there's a cooling. I wanted, but at, at the same time that there's a sudden heat. I wanted to tell him about what I'd realized about the Arbus photographs, the Vienna Arbus photographs, about the old woman in a wheelchair who lifted a witch's mask to her face when the shutter clicked, maybe to protect herself from the photographer's acute gaze 
or send back to Arbus an image of herself or to throw a wrench into the eternal chain of reflections between two people who gaze upon each other and see in the stranger looking back a startling image of themselves. <laughs> and I, that to me was a sort of paradigm for what you're doing with all these symmetries and all mm -hmm. the symmetries in the book and the mirroring and the echoing. Yeah. Uh, uh, of, 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 you know, what's strange about that is that one story, which I, I completely agree with you, it ends up having symmetry with Amor and, and, and mirrors with a lot of the other stories. Um, that's the very, very by far oldest story in the book. It was written right after 9-11 and right after I finished my first novel and I was completely brand new to fiction writing. It's probably the first short, it is the first short story I ever wrote. And then all these years passed and I didn't write short stories because most of the collection was written in the last, like, I don't know, I guess eight years or so, something like that. Um, but the weird thing about going back to that story was to realize, you know, one always feels how much one changes as a writer. So much changes, the form changed, the subject, everything is changing. And, and I especially feel like I keep, you know, I'm thinking about Susan Taub's book a lot, keep divorcing mm -hmm. from myself, most of all, um, in each subsequent book. But that story, so much is still the same. I mean, not least of all that everyone's walking around with masks on their face, right. you know, in New York City. It's an obscure disaster that has now happened. Yeah, it's a future emergency ongoing is what I kept thinking when I, when I reread it. But, but the weird thing about that was that when I wrote it, I was her age, this young narrator, and she's in this relationship with this much older man who was her professor. Like back in 2001, you could write a story like that. Right, exactly. <laughs> And uh, things have changed. I don't know if that's kosher anymore, but, um, and now I reread the story and I'm his age, you know, like, I, like I'm in my mid forties now. And I just, it was something so strange about this, like fly caught an amber impression of a young woman's ideas of what one, a man in his mid forties would be like. Oh, I think you got, I think you nailed it. <laughs> Well, he's, a, he's a particular one being a professor of medieval history who believes in the value of conflict, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But yeah, the but that, being, that sense of just like being young and being with an older man who's incredibly serious and really absorbed in his work, who's just like, you know, and you're kind of like, you know, like <laughs> trying to get attention there. And I just thought like now my mother, you know, I have real kids who are trying to get my attention and I have my real work. And it's, yeah. you know, just to be on the flip side of the things you imagine because life brings you there, you know? It's, well, it's, you got his voice and now you're the age that he-, he um, Yeah, he hopefully a little less him. grumpy than his <laughs> boy. And, um, um, well, I, I realize we've been- Yeah, we're uh, on time. We're good. Well, but I want you to read, uh, read something in your voice. Okay, I'm gonna do that. It's short and then we'll take the questions. Um, so I, I thought that I would just read from the very, very, last page and a half of the final story which is the title story to be a man and, and all, all the the audience needs to know about this is that this is a story that's been told by a, a woman a narrator she's in her mid-40s and she's been looking over her life and the men in her life the first section is about her father we talked about that the second section is about her lover who she calls the german boxer the third is about her friend rafi who's this israeli soldier and the last part is about her children. It's called childhood. And so I'm gonna, she's raising two boys. And so after this long multifaceted look at men, she ends up with these boys. And this is, this is, this is them. Enormous at birth, both are now so slender that their rib cages are visible under their skin when they lift their shirts over their heads. I know everything about what is visible of their bone structure beneath the skin and about the skin itself the precise location of each beauty mark and when it arrived and the scars and what caused them. I know in what direction the hair in their heads grows and the way they smell at night and in the morning and all the many faces they went through for the ones they each wear now. Naturally, I do. When the older one worries that he is too thin and weak, I tell him how my brother had been built the same way when he was young until without warning, like a storm comes so suddenly that someone somewhere must have prayed for it. A change came over him, that the thinness is in their genes, the sticks for arms and narrow waist and ribs poking out, all of it written into their bodies like an ancient story, but that sooner or later the time will come when this smallness and thinness 
will be overwritten, subsumed by mass, and the boys they are now will disappear, buried inside the men they will become. Your brother, he asks, trying to imagine it. My brother, who he once, but only once, saw in a moment of fury he failed to contain, pushed me across the room and threatened me with a fist. The small one is still too young to long to fall in love. He is surrounded by love and that's still enough for him. The older one has already begun to long for it, but his body hasn't yet caught up with him. About this, he can still joke with me. For now, desire and the workings of the body are still subjects for humor. But as the months pass, something has begun to loom behind it larger and larger. He is waiting for the changes he sees overtaking his friends and worries they will never come to him, that he will never desire the way the others do. It's like a switch, friends who have boys tell me. One day it goes on and after that things are never the same. The door closes on one side and opens to the other. And that's that. Another friend, a man, says that he had been a quiet reader all through childhood and then between one month and the next, he began to throw chairs. This worries the older one too. The possibility that he will no longer be who he has always been that he will lose something of his sensitivity so valued by everyone who loves him that he will become capable of violence. When I go to kiss him goodnight, he curls his body into mine and in a nervous voice tells me that he wants to remain a child, that he doesn't want anything to change. But already he is no longer a child. He is standing out on a bank between the shore and a sea that goes on and on and the water, as they say, is rising. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Judith. Um, I have a son too, so I know that it's going to be in a very deep way. Uh, it would get to me probably if I didn't have a son or if I had a daughter, or but it gets to me in a deep way. So we're going to take some questions from the um, audience. Nicole, thanks for your talent. What is your favorite book that you wrote? And also, what is your favorite work of all times by any other author? <laughs> uh, I don't, you know, it, my job as a writer is to reject everything I've written the moment that it is published. And so I have no favorites. <laughs> but I do feel, I feel the closest to whatever is most recent because it's the, you know, it's the closest to who I am now. I, I have no absolutely no ability to go back and reread my work. It's a little bit like hearing your voice on those old answering machines <laughs> that when you'd walk in and like hear your, and it just sounds so wrong and off and not, not me. Um, I'm glad they exist, but I'm very glad they exist, but um, I can't be loyal to them because I have to write something new. You're not old enough. When you get really old, then you can go back and read the, you know, the, the things you wrote 40 years ago with a sense of detachment and dispassion for the person you were when you wrote it. And even at moments, a, a admiration for the, the person you were when you wrote it, but you'd still be young. You promise? Um, you promise? I promise, I promise. Okay. <laughs> Why did you set the story Amour in a refugee camp, but with no indication of why people are refugees and where the camp is? Sorry, yeah. So that was the, I, th I thought To Be a Man was the last story and that I was gonna write. That was nine stories. And I gave the book in and then it was January. Actually, Judith, I came to your house. We were talking, this is right after Suleiman, we killed Suleiman. And you, I came to your house, we were sitting on your floor in your study and you were, we were talking about whether we were gonna get bombed by Iran, do you remember that? Yes. And I went home and I was thinking about that. We were all, I mean, you know, like how could we not be thinking about that? And I have been thinking along with everybody else all these last four years about the failure of our democracy and maybe democracy everywhere and about climate crisis and about refugee crisis and about every last reason why it was absolutely possible to imagine refugee camps in this country in the future. And there was no need for an explanation. There just was, no, there's no need. It could it so easily could happen. And so I started to think about this story and as with future emergencies in which there's this background of kind of catastrophe. And in this case, it's a global, in a more, it's a global catastrophe. I was fascinated by the ways in which the smallest, most intimate moments in our life, our decisions about our past and our relationships and why we did what we did and who we stayed with and who we loved and our regrets, that they light up 
even in those moments that, that those catastrophes are there and they inform, I mean, in this case, you know, these char this character is dying, but what she really wants to talk about is how there was this man she was gonna marry and she left him because she realized after she sat there and watched this movie, Hanukkah's Amour, which is about an old couple taking care of herself, that he was not capable of taking care of her if she should need it, if she became vulnerable. And the irony of it is here she was as vulnerable as that. And she still had lived her life having left that relationship. And, and all of the, I mean, all of those questions and regrets feel to me, they're not, they don't necessarily need a refugee camp, but at the same time that allowed them to come some, somehow to be in, in, in stark relief. And, and so that, that was the choice. No, I think yanking it quite forcibly out of realism uh, was a really interesting strategy for mm -hmm. questions in that story. And of course, I wanted to ask, I, I, I didn't dare ask, I'm glad this person asked, because one does wonder, well, where is it? And what, you know, what's really going on? And you know, yeah. what happened? What you really want to know is what happened. It's, it is, it's, it's what, happened to, yeah. what happened to create the, what the end of the world is? Uh, obviously this is sort of some sort of form of end of the world, but you also don't want to, you shouldn't know. I mean, it's- Well, there's also this question of what happens has no end. Like, right. I can tell you the number of things that I have want to ask. I want to ask Philip what happened and a million things that he wrote, and I want to know what happens. And But the fact of the matter is, is we have to live all the time without knowing what happened, without fully knowing what happened. So like, for example, Switzerland, the story of, Sor of Soraya. Yeah. The narrator has to live for 30 years not knowing what happened, but she has to come to her own conclusions about that. We always are coming to our own conclusions about what happened to people and what that meant without knowing the full story. And again, that interests me more than the satisfaction of knowing everything. It's less- Yes, and the refusal to wrap everything up, uh, to resolve, it, it, it's uh, to leave things, to give them the structure, but to leave them unresolved. I think that's a very, that's partly, not just sophistication, that's artfulness. Uh, so I, I um, but the, the curiosity is human. The taste. curiosity is very fair. Yeah. Um, we have a couple, time for, let's see if I'm, a couple more questions. Um, when I read, the, I'm reading the question, when I read The Great House, I was struck by the way you imagine the inner life of someone much, much older. And I remember wondering how someone so young could comprehend that, that you were wise beyond your years. How do you inhabit someone like that whose life experiences you haven't yet had? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I just know that I'm, I'm channeling, we all are channeling all the time, the people that we're interested in observing and we're kind of asking what it is to be them. And surely, you know, being lifelong readers gives us these special, in skills at doing that, what it is to get inside somebody's head and kind of look around there and inhabit that place. I should also say, so, so I've you know, been training for this my whole life, right? As a young reader, as, as we all have. But also a lot of times when I feel I'm writing people who are far from me. So let's say the farthest maybe I, I gotten would be an old man while being very young. And I've done that a few times. And in Great House, it was kind of extreme because the old man was kind of unlikable. He's named Aaron, he's this Israeli father and he's really tyrannical. And from the beginning I thought, what, you know, what a jerk, who is this guy? And why, why do I want to inhabit him? And it took me time to find sympathy for him, but I, that interested me. What was the thing about him that, that, I, that I sympathize? What was the thing that couldn't be reduced, right? That is both- The thing that couldn't be reduced, that's the yeah. irreducible. This is any right. students of writing, listening and take that away. <laughs> Right, right. That is not that 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 is both. That was that was both good and bad, and you know all of those things, weak and strong, all everything. And so I think I often think of I I'm drawing also from myself. I can you know we all we all know those things in ourselves, and so I'm taking a lot of my own experience and putting it into those people, um, and 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 combining it with that weird alchemy of being able to imagine oneself into another. That's really, really interesting. There's one last question. I think we have for times. Yes, one last question. Um, can you speak to this set of stories comparing compared to history of love? Your readers have grown with you and I wonder how reflections on love and relationships have evolved. Wow, what a beautiful question to end with. Um, 
it makes me first want to say what a like wow what a lucky thing to have readers who have grown with me <laughs> i guess that happens at a certain point in life if you stick around and write enough books but what a, what a glorious and um thing um sometimes i feel like i you know you can't keep them all right <laughs> you disappoint a few along the way but for those of those who stayed um i wrote history of love as a really really young woman you know i was I wrote my first novel when I was 25 and it was about a man who lost his memory and an older friend of mine said, of course you wrote about a man who lost his memory, nothing yet has happened to you. <laughs> to which I took great umbrage at the time because I felt like a lot had happened. And then I published that in a year later at 27, I started History of Love and you know, still like, I felt like things had happened, but I imagined so much in that book, so many things. And now in my mid forties, a lot really has happened to me, which is not to say that much more <laughs> won't, but I've been through many things and many loves and divorce and having children and, and sense of time passing and getting older. And, and I just have a different perspective. I think it's richer. And on top of that, there's the other layers of not just me, but all my friends, all the people I love around me to whom things are happening and I'm listening. I have a friend who has the most amazing stories. And every time I go out with my son, I'm going to write a book called Everything That Ever Happened to My Friend Itamar. And, and Judith, you were one of your story, one of your bits is in there, remember? Yes. Yeah. yeah. One of your so, and, and I think it just, you know, there's again to go back to that vampiric quality, but it's also this fascination of all these lives happening and wanting to put them somewhere and wanting to make something of them. So I guess there's just you know, more, I hope, more, more wisdom I'm more intelligence more perspective I hope do you feel less vulnerable yeah I do a little bit I have I feel like I have less to prove I feel like I make my I'm really good at making myself vulnerable Judith <laughs> I'm really good at it I like, kind of skim myself alive on the page and 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 I've learned to do that and I can live with that but um I just feel, I feel I get closer to my freedom. You know, I kind of feel um, that I, I have less to prove to anyone anymore. You know, just, I just want to go for the thing that feels most alive to me. There's the indelible image in, in, of this Israeli special forces. Um, what's his name, the character? Who's Rafi, Rafi. Rafi crawling over thorns. And um, and learning, teaching himself to ignore the pain. Yeah. Um, let's hope that love is not like that for anybody listening. Um, so I, I like let's see. It's exactly <laughs> nine o'clock. I have an inner metronome that can never. Be, uh, I, I have to, you know, I'm incorrigibly on time. Always terrible thing. <laughs> um, I want to thank you so much. I love doing this. I, it's breached the solitude. One more question. Are you working on a new book? Yeah, I'm trying to get this like novel off, this novel thing off the ground. <laughs> this novel thing off the yeah, ground. and it has no engines and it's like have, has half a wing and it's totally like a mess. But I'm trying, you know, that's how it starts. It starts with a big mess. You have to learn to tolerate the self hatred that comes with the first draft. That's the yeah. one of the most important things. Yes. Just I agree. Well, I, I thank you for inviting me to, to talk to you. And it was just a wonderful experience just getting to reread the book. And um, I know that they sent me, I think they sent me that. Is the real book out yet? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they actually sent me a real copy to my actual home, so, which is not this. Which I hope you get. It's so nice to talk to you. It was such a, such a special. And thanks to the library for this um, forum and uh, lovely introductions. And, and thank you to everybody who tuned in. Good night. Good night. Black text on white background. New York Public Library Lion logo, 125 years. Learn more about the New York Public Library, nypl.org.